welcome back to The Foreign Desk. I'm Lisa Daftari, super excited about today's guest, somebody that I have been wanting to have for a very long time. And thankfully, we ran into each other in Washington, D.C. last week when we were both doing briefings on the current situation in Iran. Uh, and a really funny story about how we met, but I want to bring him on before I tell the story. So without further ado, today's guest will be Ken Timmerman. He's a nationally recognized investigative reporter and war correspondent. He was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. I actually did not know that. That was back in 2020, uh, sorry, 2006 for his work on exposing Iran's nuclear weapons. He does briefings in Washington. He's recognized as a foremost expert on Iran affairs. He has run for Congress in the state of Maryland. He has led the uh, outside investigation for law firms rep representing the 9-11 victims. He covers Iran, Arab-Israeli conflict, Hezbollah, ISIS, Libya, served on the National Security and Foreign Policy Advisory Board for President Trump. And even that introduction does not do justice to all that this man has accomplished. Welcome to the show, Ken Timmerman. Thanks for having me on, Lisa. It's a pleasure, and I'm glad we ran into each other Very in D.C. So. Yes. Um, you know, I don't know if you know this story. This is why I actually I wanted to, to say it on the show is um, the way that we met. I actually was a graduate student and I was so excited to pick up your book, which was very new then. That was in 2005. Um, that was um, I have to bring up the title uh, Countdown to Crisis, the coming nuclear showdown with Iran. Um, and I remember picking up this book and not being able to put it down. I mean, imagine I'm in journalism school thinking, what the heck did I do? Why did I go to journalism school? I should just be focusing on uh, Middle Eastern affairs or foreign policy. This is my passion. And here's the guy who's done it. He's actually a journalist and he is focused on um, Iran affairs and he's not even Iranian. Look at that. So I remember seeing you in the documentary uh, Iranium. I remember then picking up your book right after that. And I remember reaching out to you by email. And I think you connected me at that time with Ruzbe Farahanipur, um, who is a um, one of the organizers of the 1999 student uprising in Tehran. And I ended up doing my thesis documentary on, on, on Iran. And Anyway, our, and the our, rest is history. The rest is history, which is the title of your new book. Um, yeah. We'll get into all of that. If you ever want to feel super duper lazy, super duper lazy, look up Ken's full bio because he's written about 14 books. He writes fiction, nonfiction, memoirs, history books. I mean, he's an expert on a million different things. But let's get down to business, Ken. Um, when I saw you in Washington, we were focused on the Iran situation, but I know that you are obviously very well versed in all foreign policy. Let's start with an aerial view of what's going on in our, uh, our world right now. A to F, what do you, what, what grade would you give our current administration on the way that they're handling foreign policy? Well, the Biden administration has done the most dangerous thing that any president can do and that is to uh, waver and display weakness. Uh, they did that most recently with this balloon from communist China that they allowed to uh, cross the entire United States to uh, uh, fly over our uh, strategic nuclear sites, our Minuteman missile silos uh, uh, up in Montana and elsewhere. But they've done it before as well. Remember, Biden was threatening Putin uh, you know, almost as soon as he took office in 2021 and telling him uh, he must not invade Ukraine. And if he did, uh, the United States was going to consider Ukraine as a member of NATO and on and on. And Putin looked at that and said, this is a bluff. And he called Biden's bluff. And it took months for the administration to respond with any uh, forceful policy at all. And look what we've got. A year later, uh, Ukraine and Russia I am, are mired in this senseless, senseless slugfest uh, where neither one is going to come out uh, whole. Uh, whatever results from this war is going to be a disaster, I believe, for both countries. But right now, I would have to say Putin is winning uh, for the very fact, for a very simple fact that he has the demographic advantage, a three times demographic advantage over Ukraine. The longer the war goes on, the more the Ukrainian population is degraded with people leaving the country and just getting killed in the armed forces. And Putin has human reserves to call up. You know, I, I'll, let's stick with with Ukraine and Russia. I mean, I just don't understand, you know, 
isolationism is one one policy, and that may have been the right way to actually handle this. But why is the United States um, so invested financially in this war, um, billions of dollars later? And like you said, we, we know there will not be a phenomenal outcome for Zelensky. But why do we keep putting more resources into this? Uh, I think that's a very good question. I think it's one that Congress needs to investigate. Uh, Joe Biden, as vice president, obviously had a deep relationship to Ukraine. He went to Ukraine many, many times. Remember, it was a Ukrainian company that examined the DNC server and declared that it was a Russian hack. Uh, so there are a, a lot of uh, deep background uh, ties, behind the scenes ties between the Democrat Party, between Joe Biden personally and the Ukrainian leadership. Victoria Nuland, who's his undersecretary of state, uh, is absolutely detests not just Putin, but Russians in general. She is a, uh, a borderline racist uh, against Russians. And for four years, uh, when Donald Trump was president, there was no aggression from Putin. Uh, it, and we didn't give Putin anything. In fact, uh, the Trump administration slapped pretty tough sanctions on the Russian military for their ongoing presence in Ukraine, but they did not launch an all-out invasion. They had this fiction of the Russian nationalists in eastern Ukraine that they were supporting, okay? And they had Crimea, which they had taken by force in 2014, claiming it was a long-standing Russian possession, which, by the way, it was. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's uh, all these uh, relationships and the, the the background that you speak of. Obviously, so many people pointing to that, and and they've been called conspiracy theorists, right? And we know about Hunter's laptop, which was ignored until now. It's become you know more more of a thing. I mean, we have the House of Representatives. I know a lot of investigations have been launched, or um, they will hopefully be launched. There, there's a lot of talk of them. Do you think Washington D.C. will let these um, truths come to light? I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see. I think there are enough Republican members of Congress and maybe a handful of Democrats uh, who are very concerned about the possibility of this slow creeping escalation that we are seeing in this war. And, uh, you know, first you get uh, the shoulder fired air defense missiles, uh, then you get the radar, then you get U.S. targeting, then maybe you're going to get tanks, then maybe you're going to get aircraft. And at one point, at what point, does Putin say you are now uh, a threat to our national sovereignty in Russia and use his his uh, trump card, which is tactical nuclear weapons? Now, I'm not saying we should be afraid of this, and I'm not saying that we should not stand up to Putin. He violated a, a sovereign border the same way that Saddam Hussein did in 1990. There has to be a price uh, to be paid for this. What I am saying is we did not have to get here. This was an unnecessary conflict. It is an unnecessary war. It was under control while Trump was president and Biden blew it all up. Right. Uh, like you said, not to be afraid of it, not to feel like they have something over us. But what, what we should be fearful of, perhaps, Ken, is these um, new bedfellows like, uh, you know, Iran selling drones to Russia or, or the Chinese president meeting with Raisi, the Iranian president. And, you know, um, this this new axis of evil that is forming. I mean, um, let's talk a bit about what's going on in terms of, of Washington policy um, regarding Iran's future. I mean, why do they need people like you or myself to, to really connect the dots on what Iran has been doing or what they've been capable of doing, how they've been funding uh, terror groups from the Houthis to Hezbollah to Palestinian Islamic Jihad, supporting uh, suicide bombers all throughout the world. Uh, let's not forget about the human rights crises at home. 44 years uh, now the Iranian people are out on the streets for five months telling us this regime's got to go and Washington is just silent. That's right. And, and the, again, I hate to put this in partisan terms, but it is partisan. The Democrats always seem to like the mullahs in Tehran. The Republicans generally try to put pressure on them. It is not 100% like that, but it has been that way for the past several administrations. Uh, both Obama and Biden have been trying to make deals with Iran. We had the 2015 deal and Biden wants to renew it. Don't forget that Joe Biden was the featured speaker at NIAC's 2002 annual convention. Uh, he was a darling of NIAC for many, many years. John Kerry was as well. And the, the, the Democrats seem to have this notion that 
they can make a deal with the mullahs in Tehran and the mullahs will keep the deal. Right. Uh, but, you know, as I, as I said to this conference where you and I were last week, uh, you know, there, there there's this this old uh, uh, saw in Washington that they're moderate mullahs and then they're radical mullahs. And I said, so what's the difference between a radical mullah and a moderate mullah? Well, look, the radical mullah, he'll kill you right away. OK, the moderate mullah, he'll talk, he'll steal your money and then he'll kill you. Exactly. And, That's and, and that, I think, is the illusion that the Democrat Party has. They seem to like to get caught in these talks to get caught uh, uh, getting their pocket picked and they don't realize they're about to get killed as well. But really, what is pulling the puppet strings here? And I want to remind our audience, NIAC, that you refer to as the lobby that uh, is operating in Washington, D.C. and is an apparatus of the Iran regime. So they are whitewashing the crimes of the Iran regime. And as you said, many Democrats have been supported by them, endorsed by them and work together with this lobby that, that you speak of. But let's really what, what's at the root of Iran policy in Washington? What brings them to this love affair, waiting by the phone, wanting to do, you know, just cover up all their crimes and, and continue to hope that Iran will show good behavior? Well, I think there's a there's a permanent um, bureaucratic class of analysts of Middle East quote unquote specialists who see Iran, not the Islamic State of Iran, as I call it, the government, but Iran, the nation, as a permanent force in the Middle East. By the way, I agree with that. I think that the nation of Iran is a permanent uh, force in, uh, in Middle Eastern history. The problem is the regime has supplanted the interests of the people of Iran, has supplanted the interests of the nation of Iran, and you cannot have geopolitical stability, which is, I think, what they want this permanent bureaucratic class, you cannot have bureaucratic stability when you have a radical theocratic regime, right. right? So you cannot balance Iran with Iraq, for example, as we tried to do during the 1980s. Reagan tried to do that in the 1980s. I write a lot about that in my book, and the rest is history. Uh, and you can't do it today uh, by uh, trying to downplay the extraordinary expansion of this regime into Iraq, into Syria, into Lebanon, uh, into Yemen. I mean, you just cannot downplay that. You cannot disregard it. We are dealing with a radical regime that cannot be reformed. You know, uh, it's been five months, and I know that the Iranian people have have uh, have tried this before, right? There have been there have been previous freedom movements. What makes this one um, any different from the ones we've seen in the last forty four years? Well, I think a number of things. Uh, the first, uh, that it was begun by a young female Kurdish Iranian. It did not start in, in it, it started in Tehran, but it, uh, the, the, uh, Mas, Masi was a, she is a Kurdish woman from Sanandaj. And in all of the previous uprisings, there has been almost an exclusion of ethnic minorities, whether they're from uh, Kurdistan, whether they're from Baluchistan uh, or elsewhere. This one has been all of Iran, all Iranians, very important. It's also had an extraordinary number, number of women involved. Uh, you know, the very slogan of, of the protest, women, life, freedom. This is something very new. Before they were, in the early days, it was, we can reform the regime. Well, people have given up on reforming the regime. They understand there's no reforming the regime, and they are all calling for the overthrow of the mm -hmm. regime. That is something new as well. Uh, and so you're going to have this bifurcation between the Iranian people in the streets and the regime. And I happen to believe that it's not going to be easy. But as time goes on, the regime is going to become increasingly isolated. Uh, if the representatives of uh, the Iranian people inside, the representatives outside succeed in uh, convincing European, the European parliaments and convincing the U.S. Congress to increase the sanctions on the regime, I think uh, there could be some hope for uh, the future of that country. You know, you've, you've seen so many different administrations and the way they have handled foreign policy, particularly with Iran. I mean, if we continue on perhaps a, a, a more strict and more stringent sanctions policy, but the administration does not move or pivot on their, we will not say regime change policy, do you mm. think the Iranians can pull it off? Uh, no. I, I, I hate to say it, but no, they, they, uh, I think his, recent history has shown us, whether it's in Egypt, in Libya, um, in Syria, unless you have outside support, 
uh, you will not overthrow a dictatorial regime. It's very, very difficult to do that. Now, that doesn't mean we have to get involved with boots on the ground. It doesn't mean that we have to support a particular group against another group uh, uh, of Iranians. But it does mean that the United States government should announce its policy is to help the Iranian people to achieve freedom in their own country and to overthrow a dictatorial regime. You know, I said something at, at uh, the briefing and uh, you, you said you disagreed. It was that I said, if we're going to talk about uh, ignorance versus negligence, I would say that the government, the, the Biden administration uh, is showing negligence regarding the Iran issue, uh, but that the mainstream media is showing ignorance, that they are not well aware of, of what's going on in Iran and they're, therefore they're not capturing uh, the, the current revolution movement uh, the way that it should be uh, uh, reported it on. Can you expand on that? Well, where I disagree with you is I think you're being too generous <laughs> to our <laughs> colleagues in the national media. Uh, too generous and at the same time not uh, appreciative enough of their intelligence. I think there are a lot of intelligent people in the media. I think they can watch uh, social media just as you or I can. I think they can, they can pick up the phone, they can call sources and, and see what's actually going on. But editorially, they don't want I'm to. Too. Because uh, unfortunately, uh, the national media in our country has become a partisan media and uh, they are no longer reporting facts. They are reporting a narrative and the narrative of the party that they are uh, 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 of which they are the mouthpiece does not want to support the people of Iran. They don't want to rock the boat. They want to support the mullahs. They are hoping the mullahs will give them sweetheart deals, will allow mm -hmm. their businesses to get in uh, uh, and do uh, tens of billions of dollars of business, beat out the French, beat out the Germans. Why not? And by the way, it'll be the same as the Clinton administration, which I mm -hmm. write about in my book. Those companies will then kick back money to the Democrat politicians who exactly. let them get away with it in, in the form of campaign contributions. Did you say the Clinton administration? I think that's that's a good way to sell books. Let's move on to your <laughs> latest book. I, I'm sure it'll be a, a bestseller like many of your other books have, have been. Um, as you can tell, uh, ladies and gentlemen, he is a, a, a treasure chest of, of information and, and witness to history. Um, so Ken, I wanna talk about your memoir um, and the rest is history. What a perfect title. Um, what made you write this book now? I mean, what's it all about? Can you give us the, the, the inside cover? Well, uh, you know, it, the, the book is out. If you look at the cover of the book, there's a picture of me as a young man in Paris with a beard, a leftist. You're still a young man. Yeah, you know, no, but very young, very, very young, very <laughs> young. And, and then there's a, a picture of me on the other side of the book down below uh, in a U.S. Customs uh, harness on a go fast board boat in the boat in the port of Miami uh, reporting for Newsmax. And it's really the journey of how I went from this left wing pro Palestinian uh, Paris based um, um, uh, leftist, really, to becoming a pro American born again Christian Zionist. Uh, so it's a story of a journey and a story of an evolution, my personal mm -hmm. evolution as a person politically uh, coming to Washington as a Democrat and realizing that uh, increasingly as time went on in the Clinton administration, I had fewer and fewer things in common with Democrats in Congress or elsewhere. And ultimately, I came to understand, and this is the last part of the book, that the sell-off of military technology to communist China, which what I was, what I was then focusing on, uh, was going to doom this country. And I, I, I insist on that. I believe fervently today we would not be facing a military threat from communist China if we hadn't started selling off uh, B-1 bomber technology, aircraft manufacturing technology, supercomputers to the right. Chinese in the 1990s. The Chinese right. would be nowhere near where they are today without that help from the Clinton administration. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've, I've said this many times and I, I, I think your book is phenomenal in that it outlines your personal journey with what was going on um, historically over the last 40 years of your very illustrious career. I don't want you to give away too much of your book, but I do want you to talk a bit about some of these pivotal moments, one of which uh, you, you told me a bit about when I saw you in Washington, which I had no idea the details of which were so horrific uh, that you were kidnapped and tortured when you were reporting in Lebanon. Right. And it's something that I haven't wanted to talk about uh, that much uh, it, earlier on in my career, which is why I guess it took me so many years to, to write this book. Uh, I actually started it in, in 2014 and it was just published earlier this year. So that's a long time. It's the longest I think I've ever spent uh, writing a book. 
But uh, as a young reporter, I went to Beirut. Again, I was a uh, based in Paris. I was pro-Palestinian. I had letters of recommendation from Palestinian quote unquote diplomats. Uh, I get to West Beirut. I'm going to the idea is to embed with a Palestinian NGO in West Beirut and report on the, the, the ordinary life of ordinary people during the siege, during the Israeli siege of West Beirut. And I probably get kidnapped by the PLO who reject my letters of recommendation, say, you're a Jewish spy, you're an Israeli spy. And they threw me into a, into a cell about 16 feet by 20 feet with 15 other people in the darkness, a couple of stubs of candles uh, for light during the day. And we were bombed day in and day out uh, by Israeli aircraft, by uh, naval ships, uh, by artillery, by tanks. I learned as the longer I was there, to be able to distinguish between uh, a naval uh, artillery shell and a tank shell. Uh, and and uh, things got very dicey. I was there for three and a half weeks as a hostage. They were taking people wow. out and shooting them in the end. And ultimately, uh, when people say, well, how did you get out? I have to say it was by the grace of God. And that led to my awakening uh, as a Christian, return to my Christian faith, being born again, literally in that cellar wow. underground and brought out into the light by my savior, by Jesus, because I tell you, I sure didn't get me out. (laughs) There was nothing I did that got me out. It was by the grace of God. And you continued being the roving reporter that you are taking yourself (laughs) to very dangerous places around the world. Right. And, and, and kept on reporting on the Palestinians, kept going back to Beirut. Uh, I was bitten by the bug if you wish. And uh, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, you fall off your bicycle as a kid, uh, you have two ways of reacting. You can whine and cry and go home and never ride a bike, or you can just get up and get back on the bicycle. So I got back up on the bicycle and kept riding. And it took me uh, many, many times to Lebanon. Some of those stories are in the book covering wars in Syria as well. Uh, and on into Iraq later on the 1980s. In Baghdad, I got to know just about every arms dealer who was selling weapons to Saddam Hussein. And the great secret, Lisa, they all love to talk. They love to talk. So I got amazing stories from these people, uh, both in Baghdad and back in Europe when I would see them on their home turf as well. So all of that is in the book and the rest is history. Uh, It's tales of hostages, arms dealers, dirty tricks and spies. Lots of spies. Amazing. <laughs> I, I, I highly recommend this book. Um, I have to still order mine because I, I there were none left. I think uh, everyone grabbed the ones that you brought uh, in Washington. So I'll have to get a signature from you uh, when, when I see you next time. But I want you to wrap up with this. I mean, you've already written your memoir. Of course, you're going to continue on with this wonderful career. You're going to continue doing your briefings and doing your journalism and doing yeah, you know, what you do best, being the expert that you are and and really having this um, advantage of having that, you know, front row seat of uh, uh, in, in, in world history. Um, and, I, and I think you, you, you come with this, you know, amazing, tremendous uh, advantage of seeing the world first with a, a leftist perspective and now um, obviously with a more conservative um, lens. But more on, on a just life lessons kind of uh, in a kind of way. You wrote your memoir. This is kind of all the life lessons you have had along the way, the, the moments that have been most pivotal and critical in your life. I mean, what's the takeaway from the book for you? What advice would you give your younger self or what advice would you give any young person reading your book and having interest in the work that you do? The single most important thing as a journalist, follow the facts. Don't follow a narrative. And I think that's what really sets off uh, old school journalism, uh, the kind of shoe leather journalism that I practiced for, have practiced, continued to practice uh, for 40 years and what's going on today. Do not follow a narrative. Let the facts take you wherever they take you. If the facts take you to weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, well, follow those facts and, and figure out what it means and how they got there and what is still there. Uh, if they take you to unpopular subjects, I, I've been, I was called at one point the last man standing for, you know, in a very derogatory way in 2004 for uh, saying publicly that, yes, the Bush administration found weapons of mass destruction uh, during the second Gulf War. And the administration itself stopped talking about it. Karl Rove finally explained during the 2004 election campaign publicly, he said, uh, look, we lost 
the battle of public opinion. Yes, we found the weapons of mass destruction. The DIA did its work. The Defense Intelligence Agency did its work. They had a big, thick report like that that detailed everything they found. But we didn't want to talk about it because we weren't going to go up against public opinion. Well, that was a huge mistake. You have to go. You, you have to tell the truth. So adhere to the truth and also have a moral compass inside yourself. You know, I, I, I was actually going to use the phrase last man standing, but I was going to use it in a, in a very complimentary way to say uh, last professional, real ethical journalist standing. I mean, we have people who blog and tweet and now they're, they're considered journalists and um, not anything near the caliber work that you have done traveling the world and re really being a witness to history. Congrats on the book. Congrats on a wonderful career. I have been so blessed to have you as a mentor, to have known you all these years, and right. now to That's actually right. call you a colleague and stand shoulder to shoulder right. with you at these briefings and to see you um, in Washington and to uh, work side by side. So thank you for coming on to the show and um, maybe tell people where they could find you, where they could sign up for your uh, bulletins and uh, keep in touch with you. Sure. The easiest thing is just Google my name or go to KenTimmerman.com. It's my website. I do a weekly email with a kind of geopolitical spread of what's going on that week. Uh, and, uh, you know, you find some interesting things that you might not have caught on the national news. KenTimmerman.com. And for the rest of you who'd like to subscribe to our weekly show, you could go to youtube.com slash Lisa Daftarian. To sign up for our daily top 10 email, go to foreigndesknews.com. Thank you, and we will see you next time.